Penguin Random House Audio presents Hit List by Stuart Woods. Read for you by Tony Roberts. One. It was a list of names, ten of them, half men, half women. John H. Williams, Sheila Barton, Randall Carver, Bethany Holmes, Ariana Charles, Mark Wiseman, Helena Tree, Richard Gianelli, Tricia Marshall, Stone Barrington. Neatly printed on heavy, pale yellow stationery. Stone Barrington didn't know any of them, except the last. He held it up to the light and found a watermark. Strathmore. He buzzed his secretary, Joan Robertson. Yeah, boss? She asked, setting a cup of coffee on his desk. There is a list of names on my desk. Who are they? Beats me. I found it in the mail when I got to work some time ago. Don't be arch. It doesn't suit you. Do you still have the envelope? She brought it to him. A plain manila envelope, available at any store that sold plain manila envelopes. Not as distinctive as the stationery. He looked into the envelope and saw that it still had a card inside. He shook it out onto his desk. Same stationery, but card stuck. One line printed. Dead. No special order. Starting soon. Figure it out. Is this one of your jokes? Stone asked. What jokes? I don't have any jokes, just witticisms. She had him there. Did you see who delivered it? No, it was already there when I arrived. Did you enter from the street? No, I took the shortcut. Joan lived in the building next door, which housed Stone's staff. Joan, without touching either of these two pieces of paper, see if you can scan them and email them to Dino. Dino Bichetti had been his partner when they were detectives with the NYPD many years before. Now, Dino was the police commissioner for New York City, and Stone was an attorney at the firm of Woodman and Weld. In the beginning, he had handled the cases the firm did not wish to be seen handling. Now, he was a senior partner. Yes, sir. She left the room and came back in, pulling on a pair of latex gloves. You keep latex gloves in your office? he asked. Yep. You never know when you might not want to touch something or leave any fingerprints. She picked up the two pieces of paper and left his office, closing the door behind her. Stone had finished half his coffee when his cell phone rang. Yes? Is this some kind of joke? Dino asked. I don't have any jokes, just witticisms, he replied, stealing a line. Tell me how you got them and why, and no witticisms. A plain manila envelope was found by Joan when she came to work this morning. It contained both pieces of paper. There's a watermark on the letter paper. Strathmore. It's common enough, but high quality. We use it here. Do you know any of the names on the list? Only one. Guess which? I'm familiar with two of them, yours and that of Randall Carver. Who is he? He's an ad man, director of account services at Young and Rubicam. How do you know or know of him? The name is at the top of a form that landed on my desk about ten minutes before yours did. What form? Homicide report. Carver's name is at the top. He was shot once in the head at the corner of Madison Avenue and 42nd Street by a man on a bicycle, we think. A silencer was used. We found the bicycle around the corner, leaning against the dumpster. It was clean. You'll find my prints and Jones on the paper when you receive the originals. Any others are fair game. You sure you don't know anybody on the list? Only myself. My guess is whoever sent this killed Carver just to get our attention and start us working on the case. Now we have to figure out who all these people are, and that will be no picnic. The first name on the list is John Williams. I'll bet we can find 200 of them in the phone book, if such a thing still exists. He has a middle initial, so it won't be too bad. Bad enough. 
It would have been nice if the killer had given us street addresses. Dinner tonight? Why not? Viv is on the road, so it'll just be me. PJ Clark's at seven? Done. Stone hung up and buzzed Joan. Please book me at PJ's for two at seven. Then wrap up these two pieces and the envelope while wearing your latex gloves. Consider it done. I will, when it's done. After work, Stone went up to his fifth floor master suite to his dressing room. There were two, his and one for the putative woman. He opened his safe and took out a Colt Government 380, small, slim, light, and a perfect but smaller copy of the Colt 1911 45. He also took out a shoulder holster and got it on. Then he shoved the 380 into the holster and a spare magazine next to it, then slipped into a tweed jacket. He tucked the envelope that Joan had prepared into an inside pocket. It was a nice evening, so he didn't bother with his car and driver, finding a cab instead. Ten minutes up Third Avenue, and he got out at 55th Street and went into P.J. Clark's. The bar wasn't too crowded, since the five o'clockers had come and gone, and Dino wasn't there yet. He waved a finger at a bartender, and the man produced a Knob Creek bourbon on the rocks. He took a sip, and before he could put the glass down, the bartender set another beside it, filled with a brown whiskey. Dino picked it up. Starting without me? Only one sip ahead, he replied. What have you learned about the list? I'll tell you in the back room, Dino said, heading for the back room. Two. Stone handed Dino the envelope. The originals are in there. Dino pocketed it. My evidence man thanks you. What have you learned about the list? About as much as 70 cops and other employees can learn in the time since you called. There are 110 people who have these names and live or work or both in Manhattan. 31 are named John H. Williams, so it's not as bad as I thought it would be. What do they have in common? Stone asked. You mean, besides being hunted by a lunatic? He may very well have good reasons, Stone said. Did any of them know a lunatic who might want them dead? There were a scattering of exes, uh, wives and husbands, and just good friends who were candidates, but nobody who was known to any of the other survivors so far. In fact, none of the names that anybody on the list came up with are known to any of the others. Well, that would be too easy, Stone said. Of course, we haven't talked to you yet. Dino handed him a sheet of paper with a lot of names typed on it. These are all the people who are considered candidates for being the lunatic. You know any of them? Stone read through the list carefully. Not a one, he said. No name, says Bingo? None. All right. Think about your circle of acquaintances. Do you know anyone who might want to kill you? And not just the women. Stone got out his iPhone and scrolled through all the names on his contact list. Nobody he said. Well, I can think of one person, Dino said. And who might that be? The first Mrs. Barrington, Dino said. Stone sighed. Dino never missed an opportunity to bring up Dolce. She was the daughter of a close friend of Stone's, Eduardo Bianchi, now deceased, who had taken a keen interest in him, and he in her. They had been through a civil marriage ceremony in Venice, but before the scheduled church ceremony could be conducted, sealing the deal, Stone had been called back to the USA to help an old girlfriend who was considered a suspect in the death of her husband. Dolce, incensed by his absence from Venice and the presence of a previous woman back in his life, had begun an obsessive campaign to get Stone back to the altar, and the whole thing had ended badly. Eduardo, understanding his daughter and fond of Stone, had retrieved the document that they had signed at the civil ceremony and returned it to Stone, who had very quickly set fire to it. 
Dolce now resided in a nunnery in Sicily, attended by the nuns, a number of guards. Sample complete. Ready to continue? Complete. Ready to continue.